The hit series Claim to Fame is back on ABC. From executive producers of Love is Blind and hosted by superstar brothers Kevin and Franklin Jonas, watch and play along as these new celebrity relatives do whatever it takes to keep their famous family a secret. Don't miss Claim to Fame, premiering Monday, 8, 7 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. She's over there. Hello. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are other than the victims, because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgender white dudes. What? And these crimes, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, rarely get any public attention because the news is racist, allegedly. However, we have a little announcement for y'all. We are going to go on break, getting some rest so we can recharge while cooking up some fire-ass true crime content for your ear holes when we return later this summer. In the meantime, we didn't want to leave you without something to listen to from our Pod Pal partners on the Evergreen Podcast Network. So enjoy your prides, your Juneteenths, yeah. that one holiday that rhymes with the splorth of spew lie, <laughs> and your Gemini and Cancer seasons. We will be back at the end of July 2023. Something is creeping in. Don't follow it down. 24 hours ago, I found out the person that I've been dating and seeing for the last six months is a con man. It turns out he has several other aliases and names that he goes by. I thought I'd done the research into him, but the webs and the lies that this man has told goes very deep. That is my sister Emma. Andrew Tonks's lies had been so convincing, she'd invested $300,000 with him. However, the tables were about to turn on Andrew. What he didn't know was that Emma had discovered his real identity. But to get any chance of justice, Emma had to act like it was business as usual. She, you know, we just can't believe the stuff that he sends through, the words that he uses, the things that he says to me, and one day that'll come out, but it's just... It's very scary sometimes because I'm worried that I am going to get caught. Um, but I hear it and I realise how ridiculous this sounds. How ridiculous this all sounds. But I have to play the game and I'm trying to in a way that's not going to incriminate me because I need to get that money back. I need to make him feel like I am the little person that is going along with it, that he has groomed me to be. So as the web tightens around Andrew, Emma and I start to tear down his world, blowing up his plethora of cons, one after the other. It's just so deep. I think I need this to finish the charade with him. As Andrew becomes more and more desperate, he doubles down on his lies and creates a story so completely unbelievable. It's a story that involves false imprisonment, international espionage, and even a human trafficking ring. You'll find a red flag probably for anyone you go on a date with, but it's, it's just the patterning of those red flags and the, the, yeah, the frequency of them. As we unpack Emma's story, we'll be joined by clinical psychologist Dr Sophie Muir, sharing her insight into the workings of the criminal mind. People who do con others, they, they tend to often just mimic the socially appropriate things to do and they're quite skilled at doing that. I'm Sarah Ferris. And I'm Emma Ferris. And this is my story, Conning the Con. Shadow dark upon the wall, moon slow and stretching tall, and her hands hold them up that's cold. There's a saying that goes a little something like this. 
The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men or women to stand by and do nothing. And it's probably for that very reason that my sister Emma and I find ourselves here, in this moment, prepared to share what is a deeply personal and heartbreaking story. In this podcast, we're going to be exploring my sister Emma's own personal brand of con man. But with the help and guidance of clinical psychologist Dr. Sophie Muir, we'll also be zooming in and out of Emma's story and looking at con artists as a whole. What makes these shapeshifters, these wolves in sheep's clothing, so hard to spot in everyday life? What makes a good target? And what can you do to make sure you're not the next statistic? So until about a year ago, I fancied myself as a bit of a human lie detector. Like anyone who hasn't been conned, when I read those headlines of women, or men for that matter, that had fallen prey to these criminals, I thought, how could you not see right through them? It seems so obvious, right? And I was 100% sure I would be able to smell a rat if I came face to face with one. So when my sister Emma started a relationship with a con man, you'd think I was prepared to see right through him. And yes, my spidey senses did go off, as did Emma's. But yet here we are at the beginning of her own true crime story. So let's go back to 2018 when Corona was just a refreshing summer lager and lockdown only happened in places like San Quentin. I guess the last few years had been quite full on. Uh, I'd been through, I'd raised two young children, so they're getting up to five and eight at that time. And I'd been through a divorce, a very amicable divorce, very friendly with my ex, uh, but that's still a, a big life journey and process to go through. And I'd also been starting up my new company, The Breath Effect. We rush, we get stressed, and we get anxious. And we forget to stop, pause, and breathe. Hi, I'm Emma Ferris, and I'm a physiotherapist and breathing coach from New Zealand. I have seen first hand. Overall, like I was, I was financially stable, I was physically healthy, I felt good, mentally strong. And so I was really ready to meet someone at that point. I hadn't actually dated anybody since I'd met my ex who when I was 22. So Emma's now 36 and things have definitely changed in the dating scene since she met her husband back in the day. Dating back then was pretty much just turning up at the local pub on a Saturday night. But in 2018, it's all about the online dating. I think a lot of friends have sort of encouraged me that way right. and were like, yeah, you got to get out there, you got to swipe left and swipe right. And so it kind of just kind of came up as this like, oh, let's see what this is like. Emma was living in a very small town, so single eligible bachelors were very thin on the ground. But that process of meeting someone that way is kind of unusual. Like it's not what I did when I was 22. So Emma starts dipping her toes into the dating pool and I can remember the day that we created a profile for her. I was over from London for the Christmas holidays with my family and we were sitting beside the beautiful lake surrounded by our many, many brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews and in-laws. We were all of us putting in our two cents worth and voting on what pictures to include, what hobbies to add and all in all just enjoying the thrill of Emma embarking on a social experiment that was completely foreign to the rest of us. On my return to London, our Skype calls over the following months were filled with her hit and miss Tinder tales. At that point, I was like researching what's a good relationship look like. I, you know, I'd been through a divorce and I just didn't want to, I don't want to repeat any patterns. And the dating process actually did help that. I actually ended up having a long distance relationship with a guy who was just lovely, but not the right person for me at all. So fast forward to October 2018 and Emma is online. She comes across a profile of one Andrew Thompson. Now, at first glance, his profile it isn't overly strong, but there were elements there that they had in common, and that piqued Emma's interest. Very outdoorsy, so one hiking, one snowboarding. There might have been some with family, like a, a, a group shot. Happy and friendly and nice smile. Uh, it looked genuine, which is ironic, you know. And then there was a bit below it, so he had information about his businesses and who he was so it was an entrepreneur who loved to travel loved to snowboard mountain bike and I think there was other stuff about didn't have kids didn't have um 
was an unattached sort of thing. He reached out to me once, so once we connected, I was not overly, I wasn't jumping to connect. I remember, because one of the things, again, on that tick list for me was communication something that's very important for me so he suddenly was extremely strong at communicating which in many ways may have been a red flag he he said to me wow it's so great to finally have someone a girl or a female that can that communicate and can talk so openly and about business and life and everything and he he, yeah we probably talked online for over a week and a bit he was he was selling himself like he'd been a professional sports person an AFL player Australian Football League and a wakeboarder he had had several businesses so at that point already planted the seed that he was a very very successful entrepreneur I don't remember Emma telling me much about the date at the time other than that she had had a nice date and had met someone. And then the conversation probably moved on to kids or family or work. But after the fallout of that fateful meeting, I wanted to revisit everything from the beginning. He, so I think he recommended Millbrook as it was something that he liked to go to with his family. So we met um, on a Friday afternoon and we're just going for, a, I think it was coffee, but ended up being lunch in the end. So this like small meeting ended up being for date ended up being almost two and a half, three hours. I know Millbrook and it is a really beautiful place. Great romantic setting for a first date. So I could picture the surroundings and and imagine Emma in it. But what I really wanted to know was what her first impressions were of meeting Andrew Thompson. Yeah, so he's sitting looking out to the golf course back to me. And uh, so I can kind of see, see him there. Uh, I could see his crutches. Uh, So he's a similar age, a few years older than me, but he had already talked to me about the fact that he'd fractured his hip a few weeks before that and actually had had a hip replacement. That was all because of he'd done so much damage with his sporting career before that. But he had a mountain bike accident that basically shattered. So he's about four weeks after that. And even before that, he was really worried about meeting me and going, look, I'm not in the best shape. This is not my usual way. You know, maybe I'd like to keep the conversation going and I was like look I'm not dragging this out like if there's nothing there I'm not gonna kind of hang around and to wait till you do like your body for life yeah exactly <laughs> Come back you've gone. Later. Uh, so first impressions was yeah I, it, it was interesting I kind of went eh, he's all right so I stood up and he was taller than me and it was it was in kind of nice not business attire but more nice dating clothes so we sat down and we had a lovely lunch and he talked about the restaurants that he'd had uh, that he owned back over in Australia when he was there. He's, he talked about his family and how they think that all he does is have long um, lunches. And so his okay. family's based over in Australia. So he brought up his family. All brought up his family and talked quite openly about them, that he has a sister and his parents um, have moved to a small town. All these components that draw, drew you in to him. Andrew had certainly had a colourful career up until this point. And as the date progressed, he regaled Emma with tales of his trucking company he'd owned and since sold, giving him the capital to then go into building five successful restaurant businesses on the waterfront in Hobart, Tasmania, where he was from. He had more recently sold those and at this point was always looking for new opportunities, which had led him to New Zealand. Emma said that of all the stories that Andrew told her that day, they were all so colourful and detailed and, most of all, deeply believable. And there were plenty of them. And he talked about how he went to, in 2006, 2007, went over to Canada uh, with an ex-girlfriend. And they went over together and, you know, he'd been doing really well with his trucking companies and decided to take a break from that. And over there, he realised absolute opportunities to import items from Australia, from America to Australia. Items like Harley Davidson bikes and classic cars. So I hope you're keeping up. So far, Andrew's got a trucking company, five restaurants, and now an importing business. But that was not enough for Andrew. So he was about to sign in for a alcohol company and uh, that had spirits, was selling spirits, Mm -hmm. and that it was a great opportunity. He told me this long-winded story about how he'd been to Waiheke Island with his sister and they'd met these people on this wine tour Mm -hmm. from America, and he ended up being a very famous person that had a, a, um, a gin company, and he was like, this is where the money's at to get into. And so this is, you know, he had these stories, always stories, about Mm -hmm. where the ideas and the business stuff had come from. And so he talked about wanting to do property development. 
So right. right from the start, he was like, I'm spreading, I'm, you know, I'm diversifying, I'm moving in different areas. This is what entrepreneurs do. My idols are Richard Branson and, you know, people that were just doing things at the top level. And he wanted to do things that were sustainable and, um, like, I think it was a few weeks after, but he was he was saying how it'd be really good to help rehabilitate con men and get them training them into drug truck driving and giving them a chance to get back into the workforce. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I guess hindsight really is twenty twenty. But we've gone too far ahead now. What I want to know is how did Emma feel at the end of that date? Oh, um, you know, actually, like, because he holds your gaze, he really does listen and connects with you. So it actually was a really lovely conversation in, in lots of ways. He's got a very lovely manner about him. Yeah. Because it's something, you know, there was a genuine connection between him and I. Yeah. A genuine connection. Well, that's an interesting thing to say. Mm-hmm. It's a genuine connection that you felt. That I felt at yes. the time. So, it, yes, it felt genuine and it felt that... He that he cared, that he wanted to hear from me. All those things that you crave in a relationship. That mm. someone, you know, that in the next few weeks he would just he'd check in on me. He'd be like, "Are you okay? What's happening?" And you knew I was going through something with friends of mine, and he was really worried about it. And I asked Emma if during the first few messages or first few dates, if there was anything that had made her do a double take, anything that seemed a little off with Andrew. He had said to me very early on in the messages that you. Uh, that he can't Google him. And so along this whole process, there were things that I went, well, that sounds weird. I'm going to try and Google you. And it was really important to to actually try and look at those for me. I didn't want to just go along with it. And, you know, you do, I am a trusting person. I didn't want to just assume that anybody would be bad. When Emma told me this, I remember my ears pricking up. I mean, let's be honest, Having no online profile in this day and age is pretty hard to do, but people can have valid reasons for it, so not an immediate red flag, right? So were his reasons convincing, and how did he bring it up? Because I'd said, look, my stuff's online, you'll be able to easily find me. He goes, well, you can't find me because, and this is the story he told several times, even to you, is that he yeah. had a identity theft when he was over in America. So when he was traveling through there for his business, somehow somebody had stolen his identity over there and put loans in his name. It caused a lot of financial damage to him, and it meant that he ended up using a PR agency to help wipe him off the internet. And now a word from our sponsors. I'm Sarah Ferris, true crime podcaster. And I'm Catherine Schweit, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And we have a, well, not so gently named podcast called Stop the Killing. Yep, there's a clue in the title. We need your help to end the global mass shooting epidemic. Find out how as we bring you the stories right from the source. If you would have told me that a Columbine could have happened at Columbine, I would have said no way. I remember just thinking, he's got a gun. Something rose up inside, and I said, not my school. What we can't underestimate is the power that individuals could have in stopping these school shootings. My little boy, Alex, was murdered. If we can fix the failures, we can save lives. My daughter, Elena, was killed. She'd want me to do something about this. I know she would do something about it. Join us and be part of the solution. Subscribe now to Stop the Killing podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your true crime podcasts. Over the following weeks, Emma and Andrew's relationship seem to be heading in the right direction. They've had several lovely dates and conversations, and Andrew is beginning to really open up to Emma. Yeah, so he came over to Glenorchy, where I live, and we went for this beautiful walk out in in nature. And at the end of that walk, I remember crossing the bridge that comes back to the parking lot, and he said, I need to tell you something. And it's because if I don't tell you when you meet my family, particularly my sister, she will hold this over me. So he tells me that when he was doing his businesses in Australia and doing the importing business, he was arrested. So he said it was around 2008, 2009, and he spent six months in jail in Melbourne. Right. There's no record, and there's no nothing about this. So I obviously went back and went, okay, I was going to sit on this. And he said he was never charged because it was actually to do with um, the importing company he had. So remember Andrew's importing business, the one that imported the Harley-Davidsons and the classic cars? 
Well, that had landed him in jail. According to Andrew, and I actually mean just according to Andrew, the law in Australia decreed that if a gang member purchases a motorcycle from you, you are then guilty by association and can be charged for breaking the law. Pretty sure at that stage, Andrew had wished he'd been importing something like a Toyota Prius. But either way, it was a mad story, and Emma started to dig. And I, you know, I tried to, to research those things, and he, then he said, well, he was in there for six months, it destroyed his family, they were so upset. Um, obviously, he's still trying to do his businesses at the same time. So he's still saying, hey, I'm this amazing business person I've been hard done by. He's always been hard done by through this process. And I went, OK, just let me sit with that. So this was shaping up to be one hell of a date. And I wanted to know, what was his demeanour like when he was telling her this bombshell? It was... It was so open and honest. Like, he was trying to really make you feel like he'd been really hard done by. Right. And that it was an awful experience and it was something he doesn't like to share very easily and that he felt comfortable with telling me this. Right. You know, it's kind of like that. If we're moving forward, I think you need to know this about me. It's something that I'm not uh, proud of. Um, but I also think I've been wrongly accused and it showed because I was never, in, like, charged with this crime. Otherwise, there'd be public record for it. And surprise, surprise, there was no record of it. The absence of evidence in this instant actually backed up Andrew's story. But in that very moment, Emma's head was spinning. She had so many questions about Andrew's unjust imprisonment. I guess it's like, how long were you in there? What what was it like? Um, what did you, what were they, did you, were you able to get out? What was the whole process? I mean, it's a wee while since I actually, that happened. Um, so I can't remember all the details. But I remember just listening a lot, actually, and just taking it in and just trying to go, okay, how do I check that? Am I okay with that? And I also went, everybody deserves a second chance. You can probably tell that Emma has a really kind heart. But that didn't mean she took what Andrew said at face value. She started to dig around the internet for any sniff of trouble attached to the name Andrew Thompson. But Andrew had chosen a very generic name and there was, of course, no criminal record attached to Andrew Thompson in the Melbourne prison records. I can't find any record of it anywhere. And if you were in prison and this is what happened, then it would be out there. You know, you couldn't Mm -hmm. just go and fly to a different country and then set up and do what you're doing right now. Um, I guess my gut was still going, "Mm, doesn't sound quite right. And do you even want to move forward with somebody that's done this or been through this, been through this? Keep in mind, this was all occurring on Emma and Andrew's fourth date. So I was really curious to know if there was one thing that swayed Emma's decision to continue dating Andrew. You know, it was a really hard place to be. And then that idea of, well, everybody deserves a second chance. It comes across so genuine. It was by association. He wasn't selling drugs. He wasn't doing, it wasn't rape or murder. He wasn't, it wasn't fraud. It wasn't anything that was hurting anybody else. It appeared as if Andrew wanted to put the past behind him, and his current life bared no resemblance to the person who had been unjustly detained in a Melbourne prison for six months. And he wanted to start afresh. Uh, He felt that it made it really hard on his family, and he felt terrible for them. So he wanted to move to a different country and set up and sort of start that kind of new life with businesses. But you're always kind of going, "Uh, at that same stage as me, am I really wanting to go on further with it? And I think there's a point a little bit after that that he was like, oh, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, how would you feel about deleting the, the dating app? And I was kind of like... I'm not ready to just yet. He was ready to move forward with things, obviously. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't, I don't, I know I didn't listen to my gut at that point. I was like, okay, I'm that people pleaser in some ways. Uh, You know, it was just kind of listening to it. But then it takes time to know somebody. And you know, it takes time to know their circle of friends. And that's what he never introduced to me. So Emma never actually met any of Andrew's friends, which is just another red flag to add to that ever-growing list. And I imagine you sitting at home listening to this starting to hear the distant clanging of those alarm bells, right? But let's pause Emma's story just for a moment and let me introduce you to Dr. Sophie Muir. So at the moment, I'm a clinical psychologist working in private practice in Auckland, Um, but my background prior to that has been working for the Department of Corrections. So I've had a, a fair bit of forensic experience. I've developed a lot of understanding of the kind of personality dynamics that are at play when people offend and getting a really kind of deep understanding of why people offend. It's important to note that Dr. Muir has never actually met Andrew Tonks and therefore cannot diagnose him personally, but she can speak to con artist traits in general. 
We've heard them called sociopaths and psychopaths, and for my part, I've had a few other choice names for Andrew Tonks in particular. But from a clinical perspective, how do you define a con artist? So I guess when we're thinking of people who are con men or con women, we're sort of trying to look to the underlying personality traits beneath those behaviours. And sociopathy is the term that I think comes up a lot in kind of popular culture and media, but it's not so much a clinically defined or recognised diagnostic term. So the kind of concepts that would be looking at from a clinical perspective would be psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder. And those are really defined by this kind of impaired ability to empathize and display remorse, the sense of grandiosity and superiority, and a lot of kind of reckless, bold, callous behaviors. So basically, people who are high in psychopathy have a disregard for others' rights, for the laws, for the social norms, and really are driven by self-gain. But overall, it is a small proportion. So I think the estimates are around that 1% of the population would be considered psychopaths or meet the clinical criteria for that. But yeah, so that's more of the construct that we're looking at when we're looking at people who con because they're displaying that really manipulative behavior. So now we have a framework of what defines a con artist. I wanted to get Dr. Muir's take on Andrew's lack of online profile. It had made my ears prick up when I heard Andrew's explanation for it. And it wasn't just me. Emma's friend Sasha had also picked up on it. I guess what was setting it off was that he didn't have any identity online and then the reasons why he was telling you that that didn't that's what didn't add up to me the fact that not the fact that he didn't have an online identity because I know plenty of people choose not to and that's totally fine but it was the fact that what he was saying what were the you know why he didn't have an online identity that just seemed weird and strange to me so what was Dr Muir's take is that part of a consistent pattern of lack of information and evasiveness and missing pieces? Or is it just one thing in isolation and everything else is kind of ticking along fine? So I suppose it's about putting that in context of the bigger picture of what you know of that person. So having heard about Emma's first date with Andrew, did Dr Muir feel like there were any red flags from that date? I mean, I don't think it's normal for any, you'll find a red flag probably for anyone you go on a date with, but it's, it's just the patterning of those red flags and the, the, yeah, the frequency of them. And one of those red flags was Andrew's lack of a long-term relationship, something that he'd sold to Emma as his USP. 37 and no baggage, not divorced. He'd even described himself as a bit of a unicorn because it was an unusual thing to be at that age. It was something he sold as a positive, but Dr. Muir had a different take on it. Yeah, that's that's a real warning sign. I think it speaks to a lot of different potential difficulties at that point, but it's it's really about like I'd be asking why, why, why can't you form a long term attachment? Because I think what it's signaling is potentially difficulty sustaining a certain self image that he might have created. I guess keeping up the facade probably over a long period of time becomes quite difficult. It's also your ability to kind of be responsive to someone else's needs and put their needs first for a long period is probably very difficult when you're someone who's motivated a lot by self-gain. And uh, yeah, it's again that kind of superficial attachments, not being able to form more meaningful, enduring bonds. So I think that one's a real red flag at a certain age point, perhaps like in early 20s, maybe not so much, but over time, it's like, I'd be really wanting to know why. Dr. Muir had some questions for Emma about that first date with Andrew. And from Emma's description, she was getting a clearer understanding of who Andrew Tonks was. So you had in that initial meeting, he sounded very interpersonally skilled, more that kind of superficial charm, the Mm -hmm. being able to engage with very intense eye contact, kind of making you feel like Very special. Did he tell you that he had rearranged his meetings to come meet you? He sort of said that he was working to try and make that work that afternoon. Yeah, that it was, yeah, that he'd changed his schedule, but also that he's very flexible and his family just think that all he does is have long lunches. And for someone with such a jam packed schedule, Andrew was remarkably available with his time. 
especially with someone that he'd only had one date with. I had quite a big thing happening over that weekend where I was going to a, a friend's funeral. So I was not feeling the best in the next few days after that and feeling very upset about that process. And his communication via message was probably one of the biggest, probably maybe it should have been a red flag is how much he could communicate and write to me. I was just like feeling very uh, upset and vulnerable. And he, he was like, I can meet you if you're not good. And this is only after really meeting him for that few hours. Yeah, it was a really hard moment and he was he was there, that emotionally there. But was he really emotionally there? Is a con artist even actually capable of showing genuine empathy or is it all just part of the game of chess they are playing with their victims? People who do con others, they they tend to often just mimic the socially appropriate things to do and they're quite skilled at doing that. But then there's also research that suggests um, that it's not that they have a lack of empathy, but that they've got an empathy switch. So they can turn empathy on, but so that they've got that capacity, but for them, the default mode is empathy off. I guess we'll never know if Andrew's empathy with Emma in those initial communications was genuine. But if I had to take a guess, I know which way I'm leaning. So the empathy research is interesting because what they did was I think they studied the brains, um, the brain response while they had people who were high in psychopathy watch someone hurt someone else. And in one condition, they asked them, they instructed them, empathize with this person's pain. And when they instructed them to do that, their brains had the normal empathy response. Um, But when they weren't told to empathize with them, their brains didn't have that response. So would a person with psychopathy go into a relationship thinking they are in a normal relationship or do they realise that they are feeling things that other people don't feel or rather lacking in feeling them at all? Yeah, I think there'd be a level of insight into that. I think so. Typically, relationships would be important to them insofar as they can gain something from that relationship. Generally, that kind of interpersonal exploitation is probably more the default interpersonal exploitation is the default that's one really crappy factory setting but it makes sense having spoken to so many people who have met andrew as we've pulled this whole story together there's this underlying grappling by pretty much all of them trying to make sense of what was real with andrew and what wasn't Was he intentionally criminal or had he just bitten off a little bit more than he could chew? Over the coming episodes, there is no room for doubt that his intentions were criminal, that he was a deliberate agent of chaos in these people's lives and that my sister Emma was dating a wolf in sheep's clothing. However, that's all to come. And as we come to the end of our first episode, we leave Emma and Andrew's blossoming relationship three weeks in and things, they're moving pretty rapidly. They were now exclusive. Andrew had bared his soul and shared what Emma thought was his deepest, darkest secret. Little did she know how much darker his secrets actually were. Andrew was slowly but surely building Emma's trust. He appeared successful and charismatic, and his empathy switch appeared to Emma to be permanently set to on. It all seemed to be going from strength to strength. Things couldn't be going better for Andrew. It was time for him to do what he did best. Exploit, rinse, and repeat. Shadow dark upon the wall Moving slow and stretching toward her hands Hold them up, that's cold A shadow dark upon the wall Moving slow and stretching tall And up to the mountains her gaze is pulled If you liked our story, please share with family and friends And like, subscribe and review So others can learn from my lessons If you or anyone you know has been affected by something similar please reach out for help. You are not alone. We've included some links in our show notes. Conning the Con was made with the input of Dr. Sophie Muir and the original music is by the talented Aroha Min. Something is creeping in, don't follow it down. Something is creeping in, don't follow it down.
That's it, folks. We really hope that you enjoyed that. Check out evergreenpodcast.com to find out more about today's feature and subscribe. Where can the people find us, Beth? Our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors or by giving us a five-star review. Five stars. Only, please. please. <laughs> and uh, don't forget to subscribe. You can also get at us on the socials, contact us through our website, or leave us a voicemail at 602 935 6294. This is a weekly podcast, and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. Have you ever wondered about things that go bump in the night, or objects in the sky, or other things you just couldn't explain? Then join me, Jim Mallard, on my podcast, The Mallard Report. Each week, you'll find engaging conversations with guests who are authors, historians, and scholars who lend their expertise as we discuss current events and venture into the fringe and paranormal. The Mallard Report hits controversies head-on, yet remains conversational, and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other major podcast platform. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.